She sells seashells on the seashore, I'm sure. So this week's videos has been all about the Jurassic and when we're talking about this and principles of paleontology, it would be a criminal injustice not to talk about this lady, Mary Anning. Now anyone who's into paleontology I can imagine has heard of her. Not only was she subject of the tongue twister I said at the beginning, but she's also been a massive contributor to the science of paleontology as well as serving as the biggest role model for women in science. But what did she actually do? What did she contribute? Why is she actually important? Well, let's go into that. Mary Anning was born in Lyme Regis, a small coastal town on the south coast of England in 1799 to Mary Molly Moore and a carpenter named Richard Anning. Richard, like many today, had a side hustle, and that was mining cliffs that surrounded his town for these small, strange-looking dead organisms that he found within the rocks. These were fossils, namely from the Blue Lias and Shells with Beef formations. Who the f*** named it Shells with Beef? There's no beef in these rocks. These formations laid across the Triassic and Early Jurassic, with other units going further into the Jurassic found further afield towards Charmouth. Mary herself was one of ten children, but was only one of two to actually make it into adulthood. The other being her older by three years brother, Joseph. Now already at the age of just 15 months old, Mary was the subject of local law. Three women stood underneath an elm tree watching an equestrian show. One of which was the Anning's neighbour, who was holding the toddler Mary when, out of nowhere, lightning struck the tree, with the shock also hitting the four people that stood under it. The three women were killed instantly. Don't stand under a tree during a lightning storm, kids. Onlookers rushed over to help, finding that they were too late for the adults, but Mary was somehow alive but unconscious. She was then rushed home where it was decided that the best remedy for her was a nice hot bath. It don't knock it though, because this actually managed to revive her. Her survival was nothing short of a miracle, and her family had actually said that before the accident, she was a sickly child. But after this, she seemed in perfectly good health, flourishing both physically and mentally, with many locals supplementing the legend by saying that her intelligence and liveliness was down to the lightning bolt. No scientific study has ever concluded that large electrical shocks caused by natural weather storms cause accentuated and slash or accelerated physical and slash or mental development, advance any character traits or positive idiosyncrasies, or otherwise benefit any organism in any way, shape or form. Please do not expose your child to lightning bolts, as much as they may annoy you. But even if it was just a coincidence, she survived and thrived. She attended a Sunday school that practiced congregationalism rather than the orthodox teachings of the Church of England, which basically meant that they let her learn to read and write. It was here that also inspired her in her new passion, geology. Now as Mary and her brother got older, their dad decided that it was time that they started helping with the household income in any way they could, as well as spending some quality time with them. So he took them fossil hunting. Now it was here that they got their real experience about the rocks that encompass their town. Now Lyme Regis had become somewhat of a tourist hotspot during the late 18th century, especially since traveling to mainland Europe was considered dangerous thanks to the French Revolutionary Wars. The rich and noble who could afford a holiday back then would not have been so popular. So instead they got fresh air and hot rays along the south coast of England, where they would often shop at stalls such as the one run by the Annings to buy small curiosities including vertebraries, snake stones, and devil's fingers. People would, as they do to this very day in that town, prospect the beaches and cliffs during the winter when various storms would erode these cliffs and expose fossils, before collecting them and selling them to tourists during the summer. Now, despite the booming tourism industry, the family was actually subject to poverty, especially when Richard Anning died at the age of 44 from tuberculosis when Mary was just 11. Mary and Joseph's fitness and skills for finding fossils meant that the family continued to sell those findings nonetheless. Now Mary gets a lot of the credit, but the whole family actually had a knack for fossil collecting, with her brother excavating an entire ichthyosaur skull at the age of just 14, with Mary going back a few months later and digging up the skeleton that was left at the age of 12. A 12 and a 14 year old dug up a 30 foot fossil reptile by themselves. Don't feel like you're achieving much now with your TikTok dances now, do you? 
The specimen was later displayed in London where the Annings managed to sell it to a collector for £23, which in today's money equates to around £2,100 or $2,600. Now Joseph soon took up an apprenticeship in upholstery, so he was unable to spend as much time collecting. So Mary soon took the full reins of the family business by the age of 20. And it seemed like this business was gaining some attention too. Mary had several very rich regular customers that would buy her findings and then pass them on for scientific study. One of these customers even had a heart, named Lieutenant Colonel Thomas James Birch, who wrote to the famous Gideon Mantell to say he would be holding an auction on the family's behalf for the fossils he'd bought from them. This auction brought in people from all over the country and beyond, including Vienna and Paris, in a three day long event that raised over 400 pounds, or in today's money, 34 grand in English pounds, or just over 43 grand in dollars. This meant the family was on steady footing for quite some time, giving Mary and her family breathing room to keep selling more findings. Not only this, but the high profile auction had also brought Mary a lot of attention from the geological communities. She was now starting to get famous. Now it's here you could argue there is a turning point in Mary's life. This attention and many stories that were spreading to the bigwig scientists across the country meant that she was beginning to get an informal authority on the subject. One they would listen to, but pretend not to. Now before I elaborate on that, I just wanted to let you guys know that I actually have a Patreon so if you've been enjoying the content and want to find out what other cool benefits you can get into, I'll leave a link for that in the description below. Now, I may not be living in Mary Anning level poverty, but your support does mean that I can dedicate a lot more time and resources into this channel, which means I can get more and better content out towards you, which is what I love doing. So it would mean a hell of a lot. So after some initial attention and funds helped her trajectory, Mary used this opportunity to really start cooking on gas. For the next few years, Mary worked tirelessly to not only finding some amazing specimens, but also educating herself about said findings. Reading endless papers, hand copying anatomical sketches, and dissecting modern animals to better her understanding. Now, as a woman at the time, especially one from a poverty-stricken background and one that didn't follow the Church of England, Mary was unable to get any postgraduate degrees or any undergraduate degrees. But I'll be damned if she hadn't done as much work and gained as much knowledge as if she had done. Soon she'd amassed enough paleontological knowledge as well as veteran level experience in the area that she started giving her own opinions and advising on the findings she had sold for further study. As the business grew, Mary managed to buy herself a home which doubled as a shop at the age of 27, further filling this space with her findings with the help of her trusty sidekick, Trey. Mary and Trey being a fossil hunting duo soon became a famous site that put Lyme Regis on the map. And soon scientists from all over the country were flocking to get in touch with her, purchase her findings, or even asking to be led on fossil hunting excursions by her and a faithful companion. Anning was now at the point where she was heavily involved in the community, offering her opinions on findings, as well as helping scientists discover more about her own findings. But her involvement was only behind the scenes. Women were simply not allowed in science at this point. Hell, at this point they couldn't even vote, or even be allowed to attend the meetings held by the Geological Society as a guest. So, understandably, Mary had some frustrations. In letters she wrote, she said, These men of learning have sucked my brains and made a great deal of publishing works of which I've furnished the contents while having derived none of the advantages. The world has used me so unkindly, I fear it has made me suspicious of everyone. Some argued that the unfairness was part of a bigger problem, that the working class simply wasn't taken seriously in the field of science, with construction workers or quarrymen finding discoveries but getting none of the credit when they handed it in for study. But considering the political and sociological treatment of women at the time, it's easy to imagine that this wasn't most of the problem. Having said that, Mary wasn't quite as resentful towards some scientists, especially those that didn't seem to actually want to take the credit for her. But nonetheless, they felt pressured to, otherwise the findings simply wouldn't be taken seriously. Henry Delabiche, a renowned geologist and paleontologist, had been good friends with Annie since they were both teenagers and kept in regular touch. A Swiss paleontologist named Louis Agassiz also had worked with Anning and was incredibly impressed with her knowledge and aptitude, crediting her for much of her help in his book, Studies of Fossil Fish. 
Mary also became firm friends with Charlotte Murchison. Charlotte was the wife of leading geologist Roderick Murchison and often accompanied and helped him on his many excursions. She actually stayed in Lyme Regis for a few weeks on her own just to spend time with Mary collecting fossils with her. Okay, this is a case where she wasn't direct friends with an official geologist and they probably spent a lot of time venting about the men that were taking the credit for all of their hard work. But again, you can understand the frustration. Besides, after this, they became lifelong friends and Mary would often stay with the Murchisons if she ever visited London, with Richard actually recognizing and valuing her vast skills and knowledge, just not publicly. Now, some of these men as individuals shouldn't be judged as harshly as you might think. Now, many of them were just dicks, but some of them actually did value all of the hard work that Mary had contributed into the science. But again, they simply wouldn't have been taken seriously had they said that all of this insight came from a femoid and they just would have been laughed out of the room. Now, I'm not saying that fear of social shame is an excuse for these guys. More should have stuck up for Anning and her contributions, though some did as you'll soon find out. But the problems were mostly institutional rather than individual. Anning's first major discovery has already been mentioned when she found and excavated the skeleton of a 17 foot long ichthyosaur at the age of 12. Again, 12. And it was this exact specimen that was first given the name of Ichthyosaurus. So before she was even a teenager, her and her brother were already responsible for one of the most important Mesozoic marine discoveries. After this, she obviously showed that she wasn't just a one hit wonder and discovered several more ichthyosaurs, recognizing that they were unlike any other previously known marine reptile and three more species would be named thanks to this. Anning then went on to discover the very first plesiosaur, of which detailed sketches can be found that she did. But again, credit of the actual publication went to William Conibert and Henry de la Biche. Conibert pulled a bit of a dick move here, because when he presented Plesiosaurus in the same meeting that William Buckland described Megalosaurus, he failed to mention even once who had actually found the fossil, extracted it with such precision and skill, and recognised that it represented a new group. And this creature, along with the first dinosaur, took the world by storm. Another important plesiosaur was found by Anning, which was described in a paper by Richard Owen, the guy who first coined the term dinosaur. But he again failed to mention William Buckland, who had actually named that particular species, or Mary Anning, who discovered and excavated it, mentioning only the wealthy gentleman that had purchased it. Don't get too bitter about that one though, because Richard Owen was an utter tool, and would soon get his comeuppance for all of the men and women that he screwed over in his career but that's a discussion for another video. Buckland was one of these unfortunate souls, but he was also one of the very few that actually gave public credit where it was due to Mary Anning, crediting her in his publication for finding the very first Amorphodon. On top of this, he also owed another suggestion to her when, at the age of 25, she suggested that these strange basal stones often found with the fossils might actually be fossilized feces. Buckland found that she was right yet again and took to determine them coprolites. And when he presented these findings, mentioned Anning by name and praised her skill and industry in helping to solve the mystery. On top of this, Mary Anning excavated countless fish and invertebrates, being the first to notice similarities between the mysterious belemnites and modern squids, as well as new species of ray-finned and cartilaginous fish, recognizing how special they were before the actual scientists did. So we owe Mary Anning for the discovery of the type species of ichthyosaur, the very first plesiosaur, the first Amorphodon, solving the mysteries of the devil's finger and coprolites, as well as furthering insights into Mesozoic marine ecology way beyond any of the highbrow scientists in London could ever dream of. Surely some semblance of good karma would come away. Unfortunately, not quite. Images of her companionship with Trey became bittersweet when, while helping her fossil hunting, like the good boy he was in 1833, he was crushed by a cliff fall that barely missed Anning physically, but broke her heart nonetheless. 
14 years after this, at the age of 47, and after nearly 30 years of pushing the science of natural history to staggering heights, she herself died of breast cancer. Now, a year before this, the geological community found out about her diagnosis and pulled together in order to help out with her medication, as well as making her an honorary member of the Dorset County Museum. Three years after her death, the Geological Society realised far too little and late just how much they owed to her and contributed towards a dedicated stained window in her honour. And Henry de la Biche, her lifelong friend and now president of the Geological Society, for the first time in the history of that society, wrote a eulogy for a woman, which he published and read out at one of the meetings, beginning with... I cannot close this notice of our losses by death without adverting to that of one who, though not placed among even the easier classes of society, but one who had earned her daily bread by her labour, yet contributed by her talents and untiring researches in no small degree to our knowledge of the great Analiosaurians and other forms of organic life entombed in the vicinity of Lyme Regis. Mary Anning was a criminally underrated scientist. Not a fossil hunter, not some enthusiast, she was a scientist. And one of the leading ones in all of paleontology and geology. But up until her death, she was leading this behind the scenes unwillingly. In the preceding years after her death, more and more posthumous credit has been given to the mother of paleontology, to the point at which we now know just how much we owe to her. I don't know if it would have been of any consolation to her, but millions of female geologists, whether they be retired, currently working or in the making, see Anning as their hero, and the entire geological world can do nothing but admire her. Now, science is yet to prove or disprove the presence of an afterlife, or if anyone in that afterlife can witness things in the living world. But, if they can, I really hope that Mary Anning can look down as everyone in the world of science joins me in saying thank you. Catch you guys next time.